In the final part of our entry draft preview, we talk about the fourth and fifth round picks the Flames traded away, and if they could have got better value if they kept them, and what we can expect the Flames to do with their sixth and seventh round picks. This is Fireside Chat, episode 49, Bringing Up the Rear, recorded June 7, 2014. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Welcome back. This is Dan and Matt again for the third of three parts of our draft preview episode. How you doing, Matt? Good. Looking forward to getting through the last of this. Yeah, me too. And we're getting ever so close to the draft. Um, I'm excited to see what the Flames are going to do, as we've talked about in the last two episodes. There's a lot of uncertainty here. There's a lot of ways the Flames can go, as with any year. And I always find it interesting to see what's going on in the draft and see how close our predictions were to the actual Flames picks. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this draft just to see exactly what direction the Flames are going to be moving forward in under their new management and all that. So I have a feeling we're going to see a lot of picks move this year too. I think that there's a lot of teams that are going to be looking to upgrade their teams. I think there's a lot of players that teams will trade up or down for. So I think compared to some other years, we're going to see a lot of movement of picks at this draft. Yeah, I think so as well. Especially because next year's draft is like apparently the best draft since 2003. So I think uh, teams might be more apt to move picks this year instead of, you know, the dreaded, oh, we don't want to touch 15 in case of McDavid or... Yeah, no, for sure. We've already profiled the majority of the Flames' picks. The Flames have the m- most of their picks between um, 1 and 90. They have two two picks in the second round, two picks in the third round, and one in the first. We actually don't have a pick in the fourth or fifth round. Uh, the Flames gave up their fourth round pick to Toronto for Joe Colborne and their fifth round pick to St. Louis for uh, Chris Russell. So, Matt, I'll, let's go back and forth on this. Do you think that based on what you've seen is available in the fourth round, do you think giving up the pick to Toronto for Colborne were getting better value? Oh, most definitely. I, it, there are good and interesting players that will be available in the fourth and fifth round, but... I would take a guy that ha- can get 30-plus points in the NHL any day of the week over that. Yeah, I think the fact that we made a trade with Toronto to get a guy who has jumped full-time into our NHL lineup. He's not a guy who was, you know, s- shipped between the AHL and the NHL and that sort of thing. And a player who looked better at the end of the year. I think we could all agree Colborne grew over the year. I think if you were picking fourth round trying to get another Joel Colborne, it would be a shot in the dark. So I think the Flames definitely got a great value with that pick. Yeah, like, uh, honestly, I don't think that there's a single prospect that in there as of right now that you could even say has a reasonable chance of becoming that caliber, let alone any better than what Colborne is. So, and it's not like Colborne's old, you know, he's only 24, so give me a break. Yeah, I mean, he's a proven... Well, I wouldn't say a proven NHL player. He's a guy who will probably be on the NHL roster again next year. Yeah, it, it'd be tough to replace him or say that, oh, you you know, let's not give up the fourth because we think we're going to get some better. So I think the Flames made a great deal there. No, anytime you can trade a fourth or a fifth round pick for a young NHL player like Colborne, you make that trade because, you know, there's only a 15% success rate for picks after the third round so you know i'd rather take the sure thing that because you're getting an nhl player than the potential chance that you might fluke out and get lucky so i think we'd both agree then that the fifth round pick being traded to st louis for chris russell was also a really good deal there i think we just saw russell got re-signed not too long ago I think this is a guy who's going to be a key member of the Flames for at least two, three years. So I think, again, fantastic deal there for the Flames to identify Russell and be able to get him so cheap. What do you think? Uh, Exactly. And the way I look at it is, can you get more for the player than what you gave? And, you know, there's only a handful of defensemen in the league that got 29 points last year. And 
you know, Russell didn't even play the full season, and yet he got 29 points. He only played 68 games. So, you know, you might have somebody that could eventually be worth, you know, a second or a first round pick possibly even down the road if we go to trade Russell. So, you know, and plus he might uh, free up Weidman's spot by taking it over. So, yeah, that's an interesting point you brought up of what can you get for a player as opposed to what you gave up for them? If you were going to trade both of those guys this offseason, um, what do you think Colborn is worth right now? You could probably get a second plus something, you know, a prospect of some sort. And Russell, you could probably get a second plus something. The, so the plus giving something up on and a Russell, fifth. The plus something on Russell would probably be a little less, but... You know. Yeah, so giving up a fourth and a fifth round pick then, we've already made our money back. It's not like these guys are a long-term project that if they turn out, we can get that back. You know, if we needed to flip them today for whatever reason, there's no doubt in my mind we could get more than what we paid. Well, they had 57 points this season between the two of them. The odds of the fourth and fifth round pick getting 57 points in his career is minimal, so... You know, it's already a win, just from a pure results-based system, you know. Like, not every yeah. fourth and fifth round pick is going to be a John Gaudreau, you know what I mean? Like, it, or a TJ Brody, be. so... Well, and, and even Johnny Gaudreau, we have yet to see what he's going to do at the NHL level. Exactly. So, who he knows? He has one professional game under his belt at this point. The Flames also don't have a sixth round, their sixth round pick, we should say. Um, this one's more controversial. The Flames shipped the sixth round pick to Dallas for Lane McDermott, who really, when when they made that trade, the three of us, you, me, and Luke, were on the show saying, we really didn't understand why we needed this guy. Um, he just seemed like another tough guy in a system that had tough guys already. Um, and it turned out about two months later... Lane McDermott decided professional hockey wasn't for him and retired. You and I had talked before the show, and I said it's too bad that if he's retired within the same year we got him, we couldn't get our sixth-round pick back or anything. But I think if you're going to trade for a guy like this who's really, you know, an iffy player as it was, I mean, even before he retired, he wasn't much of a player. He's a, a goon at best, I think. A six-round pick seems like a good deal for that, or a good pick to trade anyways. And I'm not too sad about losing a six-round pick. What about you? Yeah, well, at the time, you know, we basically, in effect, traded Tim Jackman for McDermott and, like, the difference of, like, 15 to 20 picks in the sixth round. So at the time, right, it made the sense. the Flames cause... acquired Anaheim's six-round pick for Tim Jackman. Yeah, so at the time it made sense because you're getting basically a 10-year younger version of Tim Jackman for the difference of 20 picks. It's just unfortunately that McDermott decided to call it a career. And, you know, I don't fault him for that, and I can understand why he did, and that's fine. But, you know, you'd make that trade again, you know, to me, and... Again, it's a six-round pick. Oh, you get a slightly later dart to throw at the board than the early one. You know, each one has about a 15% chance of succeeding, so who cares? I guess if I'm going to trade for a player that does retire, I'd rather trade a six for that player than, you know, anything higher than that. So I think that's a good... And as you said, we got the pick back, so kudos for management for kind of covering their butt there by getting another sixth round. But... You know, I think it's a it's a necessary, I don't want to say necessary evil, but it's a necessary cost of doing business. And sometimes that's going to happen, and I think it's a, it's a mitigated risk by getting rid of a sixth. You don't want to trade much more than a sixth for any AHL grinder. Yeah, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Lane McDermott, we hardly knew you. I don't even know if he played a, an NHL game with the Flames. He did played he? one or two, yeah. I think he ran Jaguar in the one game. Oh, wow. So maybe he just retired for fear of his life because running Jaguar is going to cost you uh, next time you're on the ice. As we mentioned, the Flames do have a sixth-round pick. Um, it's the 175th pick overall from Anaheim that we traded for Tim Jackman. 
At the time, I thought that we weren't getting enough for Jackman, but it is what it is. And the Flames also have their last pick of the draft at 184th overall in the seventh round. We're not going to profile individual players for these rounds because by the time you get down that low, it's hit and miss as far as what you're going to be able to get, who's going to be left, that sort of thing. But we'll talk about the general themes of what you usually see in the sixth and seventh round. Usually in this round, you're seeing goaltenders go. A lot of teams take goaltenders low in the draft. And a lot of goaltenders that are taken low in the draft aren't necessarily junk goaltenders. They've gone on to be AHL starters, NHL backups, even some of them NHL starters. You also, this is when you see a lot of Russian players taken because there's often a uncertainty about Russian players and if they're going to come to North America, you often see Russian players taken here. Any other th- types of players you would throw into that category, Matt? Uh, not really. Like, usually, like, other than that, you usually see physical forwards, like, say, like, Tim Harrison last year. That type of guy taken. More kind of the the checking forwards. Yeah, your f- next, your fighters of next year type of thing. That kind of thing. Those are the types that you usually see in the 6th and 7th rounds. You know, very seldom do you get an Andre Palat or any of the other late round superstar caliber players. So, you know, you... Uh, Usually the only good, good players to come out of the late end of the draft are goaltenders. So, you know, and I wouldn't be opposed to the Flames taking someone. You know, you usually it, it'll, the ones that end up being good from the deep part of the draft are ones that are playing in obscure leagues or might have odd things about them like they're from a weird country or whatever like uh say like frederick anderson from a couple years ago uh he was playing in the danish league of all places and well he is danish but you know you don't expect a goaltender to come from there and carolina took him in the seventh round and when he went to Sweden, he performed very well and ended up getting redrafted by Anaheim and became their starting goaltender. So you need someone obscure to... Usually that's where you're going to find goaltenders where they might be overlooked because where are they from type of thing. <laughs> so Yeah, a lot of people always reference Pavel Datsuk as a great example of what's available in the seventh round. But, I mean, that was a one-time thing. I mean, if you would have asked the Red Wings at the time, they probably wouldn't have told you, oh, yeah, Datsuk's going to be, you know, our next key player on the team. So those guys, I think, have an uphill battle to fight, but they wouldn't be ranked where they are if they didn't have some talent. I mean, as much as we say, well, they're not very good players, they're still a hell of a lot better player than probably anyone listening to this podcast. You know, you can find the hidden gems like Andre Palat or Patrick Hornquist or Zetterberg or Datsuk or, you know, guys like Bufflin or Lundquist. So, you know, there are some. It's just, it's difficult to find. You also often see these picks dealt, especially at draft day, as teams are moving up. You might see the Flames or somebody trade their seventh round pick to move up three or four rounds in the fourth round, or three or four picks in the fourth round, or something like that. So I wouldn't be utterly surprised if the Flames didn't end up picking both sixth and seventh. I think we could see this team move up this year or move the pick along with, you know, another pick for a player or something like that. Um, so these picks are often, I think, iffy as to who's actually going to make the pick with their 6th and 7th, but would you be surprised if the Flames ended up trading these picks? No, and I wouldn't be surprised if they used them or whatever, I don't know. It, it's one of those things that most of these late picks are basically irrelevant shots in the dark. And I mean, some of the players that we profiled in round two and three, you might have the Flames say, we want more than one of these guys and we can move, you know, up or down two or three positions to make that happen. So it might cost a seventh round pick to do that. And I think that's more than an acceptable cost to move up in rounds two or three. Or even to get back into the fourth round. Yeah. If you got somebody that you really want and the 
you have to move up three picks to get him, and the cost is a seventh round pick. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, you know, just I can get, also go see get the, the team... guy that you want. <laughs> exactly. I could also see the team moving some uh, roster player, either NHL or AHL, along with a sixth or seventh pick to get themselves into the fourth or fifth round if they think there's a player they want there. You know, maybe you see them move a David Jones or a Shane O'Brien or somebody like that and a seventh to get into the fourth round. Um, even, you know, a, another player like somebody from the AHL that's not a, a key player to this roster, I don't think that's unreasonable either. Just got to wait and see. So, Matt, you have a better knowledge than I do of this overall draft class. You spent the last, approximately the last month um, profiling the draft class for us on firesidechat.ca. What's your overall impression of this year's draft class? Uh, a lot of people say it's a weak draft year, but it's really not. Like, there, There's no clear-cut number one guy like last year with McKinnon. On the whole, the difference between... Like, the second and third rounds this year versus the second and third rounds last year is minimal. You know, like, you're going to get talent in each draft. So, you know, it, you might not have the flashy Nathan McKinnon type guy this year, but you, you're you still going to get a really good player in the first round. You're There are a lot of interesting options in the second and third rounds. So, you know, it's just a matter of waiting and seeing how the cards unfold between now and when Trevelin goes up to make the first selection. So, but, you know, it's, you know, there, we do stand a good chance to get several really good players into the system this year. I think you're right. I mean, looking at the articles you've done, doing a little bit of my own research... I think that there's more players that are going to be perhaps longer term, I don't want to say projects, but might need more time to develop into solid NHL players this year. But I think we have time for that. I don't think you're necessarily getting as many players where the Flames are picking that might step in right away. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And that's fine as well, because we do have a fairly decent crop of players that are already coming into the AHL and fighting for spots there and the NHL, so you don't need to create a logjam for yourself. So, mm -hmm. you know, like, say, like, if the Flames were to take a few of the project defensemen that are going to take four years, well, that's fine, because by then you got all of Kulak, Culkin, Kanzig, Watherspoon, Sealoff, Wa, Gilmore, all figured out by then, or mostly figured out by then. So once they're taking their spots, then then you can let the next bumper crop come in and start filtering in as well. So you got to layer it. From a fan perspective, um, as we know, the first round of the draft is on TV every year. I think that this year the top 10 picks are going to be more exciting than they have in the past. I think usually we know the name of one, two, maybe three or four guys if we're lucky. I think this year the top 10 with the five North American skaters we talked about, the top five uh, European skaters being very good players too, I think there's going to be a lot more excitement around that and a lot more, you know, no matter where your team is picking, whether you're Calgary picking fourth or another team picking later, I think there's a lot of excitement there around who's going to go when and I think a lot of uncertainty as well as to who's going to go when. Well, realistically, there's a very good top eight in this draft with a couple that could slide in. So... You know, if you're, say, Toronto picking eighth, very good chance that you're going to get a very good player. So, you know, there would be a lot to be excited there as well. So it's very much a movable draft. Like, you could have someone that's rated to go 25th in the draft end up going 50th because other teams like other guys better. That doesn't necessarily mean that the guy at 25 is worse than the other guys that are picked ahead it's just a matter of preference and as i mentioned earlier i think one thing that will stand out this year too is i think we'll see a lot more movement uh, maybe not of draft picks but i just think we'll see a lot more trades in general on the draft floor this year 
because I think there is a lot of people that have their favorites um, are going to want to move into a position to get them. But I also think teams are going to be looking ahead at you know uh, free agency. And to me, because of the free agent class this year, we might see a lot more movement happening as well. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Especially with the cap going up, there should be a lot more flexibility. Exactly. And you, you, know, you might see teams like Calgary more active at the table because they might be doing things like taking on cap and that sort of thing. So it'll be interesting to see what goes down in general. Yeah, definitely looking forward to it. Any last words on the draft, Matt? Just uh, can't wait for it to come up and see how it all unfolds. June 27th is the first round, and June 28th is the second round this year from Philadelphia. It should be a good time. And uh, right away after that, we turn around on the 1st of July, and we have free agency. So everything's going to come to a a T here pretty quick. Matt and I will be back shortly um, in the next little bit after the draft, we think, to do a free agent preview episode. So stay tuned to that, and we will talk to everyone fairly shortly. Enjoy the draft. Thank you for reading my articles, and thanks for listening. Now Matt gets to take a break. His articles are over. He can sit down, relax, and enjoy the draft like the rest of us. Fireside Chat is produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.